¿Qué tal amigos? Stuart here from Spain Speaks with another podcast this week. Again, I'm joined by John. How are you today, John? I'm good, thanks. Good morning. Back in Madrid after your uh, weekend away in Portugal. Yeah, fantastic weekend. Really good. You uh, you enjoyed Portugal? Yes, the drive was a bit long to get down there. I think it took us a good, uh, with a couple of stops, good six hours uh, to get there. But uh, the, the place was a uh, really nice little uh, town. Uh, lovely people, uh, really friendly, really friendly, and uh, yeah, the, the cricket was good fun. So Portugal was a good experience. Yes, yes. So I've been there a couple of times, but it's the first time I've been to this area. It's kind of like about 30 minutes uh, south of Coimbra, uh, a place called Ancio. Really nice, and the, so the cricket team were a fantastic bunch of guys, and the teas were amazing. Did you enjoy the, the? oh sorry, did you win the game? We won both games, yeah, so we're now the proud uh, holders Iberian of the Iberian Cup. Cup. All right, yes. good, good, good. Yeah. Doing now, Spain proud. <laughs> yeah, that's it, that's right, yeah, doing Spain proud from a cricket point of view. Now, um, as uh, we did last week, we'll go through some of the comments firstly from the last video. The first one uh, that we'll highlight today is from Kit Thornton who apparently is planning on moving to Andalusia, and he, uh, he asked the question, uh, so uh, three and a half thousand euros a month should be fine in Andalusia for, for, for both um, Kit and his wife to get by. Three and a half thousand euros, um, fairly good in Andalusia, I'd say, for two people. I think that's pretty good, yeah. I mean, uh, obviously, again, it depends on what you expect to get for those three and a half thousand euros. If, you, if you're going to turn up to Andalusia and you want to rent a detached house uh, with a swimming pool, obviously, that's going to cost a lot more than uh, getting a, a flat somewhere. So it depends on the quality of life you want and what you actually want to get out of it. Uh, but I mean, I mean, uh, the Spanish people uh, in that area. I know a few people that live down there, and and they get by on a lot less than that. So, yeah, I I think I've I've mentioned this in another video that I did um, maybe last year or the year before that uh, it all depends on your lifestyle. Yes, as you said, you know, if you want to have the luxury villa with the pool and the you know all of that type of stuff, obviously that type of money uh, you're going to be you're not going to be able to do it for that. But uh, for three and a half thousand euros, you should be able to to live fairly well. I mean, you could even live in Madrid with that money, re realistically, right? Oh yes, of course. I mean, uh, it's it's not a small amount of money, uh, especially in Spain. But again, it really depends uh, on the basics of what you want uh, to live on. Uh, if you get a flat, a basic flat, if it's just two of you, maybe you get a two bedroom flat somewhere. It could be with a swimming pool in the community. Um, and with other things like paddle, uh, the yeah. Spanish like half tennis, half table tennis That's type. Uh, That's how else to describe paddle. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, there's things uh, that they tend to have in the community areas uh, which are included, and you can get a pretty decent uh, flat for a, a lot less than a thousand euros on the coast, uh, and with all those things included. But then if you want a house, obviously you've got to pay for it. And so you, you uh, get what you pay for. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So uh, to answer the uh, the question or uh, Kit's doubt, yeah, absolutely, you should be able to live with 3,500 euros a month in Andalusia. So, uh, yeah, go for that. Uh, he also says here that he's trying to get through the, um, trying to get a visa. He's in the process of selling his house and his car. He's studying Spanish, which we spoke Good. about last week as well. And uh, he wants us to wish him luck. So uh, good luck, Kit, with your adventure here in Spain. Yeah, good luck. Now the next one is from uh, Hablo Irlandés. You know Hablo Irlandés too? Uh, no, I don't think I've got any Gaelic in me at all, actually. Uh, that's uh, definitely going to be a new language for me if I ever learn. <laughs> so uh, he says, great stuff again, lads. Would you ever consider doing something in Espanol, in Spanish? You both uh, would have great insight into some of the challenges that native English speakers face. Um, well, we were just talking about this uh, before uh, recording the, the podcast here today and yeah we could do something I don't know whether we'll do it in these videos but we could do something um, maybe in another more specific type of video there is a guy that does this type of stuff his name's Gordon have you ever seen Gordon's no. videos mm. 
I think it's called Lightspeed Spanish. He lives, um, I think, in Guadalajara or somewhere like that, and uh, he does all of his videos in Spanish. Okay. Guy from England. I'm not sure where he's from. Um, he started off. I think he did it as a, a challenge to help him, to help him uh, learn Spanish and to to put himself out there. And he also helps people now to to get over those barriers uh, that, that that come from trying to learn a language. So that's good. You can check that out. But we could also do something similar. Uh, he also had another comment here. And he uh, he said that he had some some uh, negative experiences or some funny experiences, uh, let's say, when he was in Valencia. And he said that he went for a jog in the park and he got back to the hotel quite sweaty. And he uh, said to a woman that was going uh, going by, he said, uh, "Estoy caliente." <laughs> uh, so he uh, translated a little bit too literally there, yeah. where he meant to say "tengo tengo calor." Um, have you had any of these? Um, um, linguistic faux pas, John. Oh, loads, loads. Uh, I've done that one actually. Have you? Yeah, I did that a few times at the beginning because it just translates uh, very nicely, and you think, oh yeah, that's that's right. And then basically you're coming on to whoever you're saying it to. So yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's quite an interesting one. Um, I've also been through a drive-through McDonald's and asked for a, a McPoya sandwich. Really? Uh, yeah, which uh, spent. I think the the girl who was serving me spent about three minutes laughing before actually being able to control herself and <laughs> uh, and double check what I actually wanted. <laughs> What's it called in uh, in Spanish? It's McPoya. Oh, it is. Yeah. Mc so uh, okay. it was a McChicken. McPoya. Yeah, McChicken. Yeah, and I uh, asked for a McPoya, which is uh, slightly different. Uh, between pollo and polla. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, basically we're talking about a chicken or male genitals. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can imagine it was uh, had a had a bit of a laugh there. So polla is not a female chicken. No. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> okay, that's one of the things as well. And the yeah, the estoy caliente, which uh, she said the woman gave him a funny look, and uh, he thought she wasn't very friendly. Well, that's probably why. And another one, he says. Um, he was in Seville, and he said, "Ah, mis huevos," and the waitress came with his eggs Benedict. Yeah. <laughs> now, when somebody here in Spain says, "Ah, mis huevos," what what do you interpret now? Again, it's another Spanish um, way of talking about male genitalia. So, oh, that's uh, it. yeah. So I can imagine the waitress uh, found that quite amusing as well. Exactly, <laughs> but uh, he wasn't incorrect because uh, I mean, no. his eggs were being put on the table but obviously the uh, the waitress interpreted something else as well which is actually quite funny yeah playing on words <laughs> exactly. like play on words in the english language uh, they do the same thing there with that as well exactly so. exactly so that's it so uh hablo irlandes good luck with your uh, spanish learning there uh, hablo irlandes and uh yeah in a couple of uh, podcast time or we might do something different on that aspect of uh two uh two giddies speaking uh, Spanish could be interesting yeah yeah definitely put myself in a few funny situations on a couple of occasions (laughs) (laughs) I think we all have done yeah but it's also important that if you do make a mistake when you are um, you know speaking the language for the the first time don't let it put you off you know you've got to get back on the horses they say straight away and you know, um, don't uh, don't let your pride get in the way that you you know. That no, you're... you've just got a smile. Uh, take it as a bit of a learning curve. And, That's it. And take it as it is. It's just it's just a funny situation, uh, and it always comes back to. Uh, help you in the future that's it uh, that's it and a lot of times like this is always good for a laugh as well well it's, a, it's actually one of the things that the that a lot of spanish people say and we, we have a, a few uh, spanish people listening learning english here on this podcast that um one of the big problems for spanish learners is that they when they do make a mistake they, they really go into their shell you know yeah and it's not necessarily i think um most people really appreciate when someone tries to speak a, a different language mm. that's not their mother tongue and i think really if you make a mistake you just need to to, to push through it remember yeah. the mistake and carry on and there and it is true there's a lot of what we call false friends uh, when it comes down to uh, word translations between spanish and english um i mean what one of the funny ones that a friend of mine did uh, while we were in mallorca uh, she was talking to someone who's English and she just came straight out with, uh, oh, I'm constipated. Yeah. 
and, and the person was looking at her like that's a really weird thing just to come out and say you know to someone you're, you're constipated yeah. okay that's that's nice for you and what she was basically trying to say was she had a cold she had a cold uh, that's right yeah, yeah. she so. didn't she didn't have um she didn't have the other problem uh yeah. that if you're constipated yeah well that's right spanish constipado means that you have a cold that's right or uh, resfriado i think they can also say if you want to yeah. avoid that problem just use that word there <laughs> but one of the things about that is that you know uh, uh, i know that the the in 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 england uh in australia there's lots and lots of people that come to australia that that don't speak english obviously yeah and I was used to listening to people that didn't speak perfect English. If you came across Italians or Greeks or uh, Chinese people, Vietnamese, th yeah. their English is not perfect, but they're able to communicate. Yeah, we have the same thing in England. That's it. We have um, uh, a lot of people coming over from Pakistan, India, um, maybe that are coming uh, to be with their family that are already living in the mm. UK, and they have to obviously go through and learn the language and everything. Uh, we have a lot of Polish in the UK now, um, and we do have a lot of Spanish. Mm. Uh, and in fact, I think the, the last time I looked, there was about 66,000 Spanish people living in London. Uh, 66,000 in London? Yeah, just in London. Uh, I mean, a lot of them are students, um, people that are uh, going over just to learn English as well, uh, maybe for a year and uh, taking on a waiter job or yeah. something, just for a short job. But even in my hometown now, uh, Milton Keynes has got the uh, head office of the Banco Santander. Um, so we have a lot of Spanish people that have either moved to the UK to work at this office or they're um, you know, coming over regularly uh, from, from Madrid. Uh, you actually see them on the plane quite a lot. And you hear these people talking and, and all, all I have for them is admiration. They're, yeah. they're speaking uh, a language, they're working in a different language. I mean, no, I don't think anyone has, ever has to be embarrassed about trying to speak another language. But, absolutely right. Don't be, don't be afraid to make mistakes. It's all part of the learning process. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to tell students here all the time, you know, that, um, that they do, uh, you know, get a little bit nervous and uh, they get a bit worried when they make mistakes. I've even seen people get angry when they make a mistake. Yeah. Oh, I've made that mistake again. But uh, it's all part of the process. That's right. That's right. So uh, don't worry about making mistakes. I make them all the time still, and I've been here for 20 years. Same here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you just have to try to get over it um, and, uh, you know, do your best. Do your best. That's and it. Also, you have to remember, not everyone is uh, perfectly capable of learning a second language. Everyone's brain is switched on to different uh, academic uh, things. Uh, some people are really good at math, some people are really good at geography, history, remembering dates, and other people are fantastic with uh, languages. Not everyone is uh, perfect at everything. Uh, it's something that I always find very infuriating with schools. Uh, you know, instead of trying to push uh, kids to make lots and lots of extra effort, go to after school classes and things to, to get their maths to a, a level nine and nine out of 10, you know, a C is sometimes uh, is good enough for someone like that because they've got maybe other talents, uh, language skills, and mm. really good uh, uh, history or geography or science. Everyone's different, and I think sometimes you have to, rather than try and push uh, people to to do something perfectly in something uh, they're not good at is try to get them to get even better at something they're already good at mm. and become an expert. Um, but with languages, obviously, it's often a case of you, you need a language or need, need to be able to communicate um, to people, but it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect. You can, uh, if you can communicate and get your point of view across, that's enough initially. Absolutely. Uh, and then you can go go on from there and improve bit by bit. There's no need to get a 10 out of 10 no. uh, in exams every time. No. And um, my experience is that you'll never speak Spanish perfectly. I don't think I ever will. No. Um, I, I was one of those people. Um, languages were never my forte. Mm. Um, I was uh, I, I picked up uh, geography and maths uh, very quickly, uh, but languages just were weren't one of my uh, strong points. Yeah. Um, but I got thrown in the deep end, and I say within six months I was yeah. speaking that's fluently it. and that's communicating. It. So, and that's the case of um, all of those uh, people that go to live in you know English speaking countries as well as yeah. uh, uh, like I said before, you know the the Italians, and uh, they have to communicate. It's what they do. So, yeah. yeah, that's it. Now the next one here is from uh, El Zorro, El Zorro. Um, terrific podcast enjoying these a lot more than your other videos that's a contrast from a couple of the comments we had last week 
Um, thanks for that, uh, Zorro. Uh, you really get down to the nitty gritty of living in Spain with two different perspectives. Keep it up, please, senores. Big thumbs up. So good. Some positive feedback uh, on these podcasts, uh, which is uh, the objective here. You know, we're, we're not we're not trying to um, we're not trying to. Uh, to influence people in any way, I don't think. We're not trying to, you know, impose our uh, views or opinions on people. We're just trying to, you know, say what we do and how we've done it over the years. Exactly. I think uh, p- people need to realise that there's no hidden agenda uh, with these podcasts. We're, we're doing it uh, out of the love of living in Spain. Um, out, and also to share our experiences with other people. Um, personally, I'm, I'm doing it for that reason. I love having a chat with, uh, with you as well, obviously. Um, but also, I share my, um, uh, my interviews with you, my podcast with you, uh, with my students. Mm. And it gives them extra listening practice. Absolutely. Helps them get used to another a- accent as well. Cause Absolutely. You've got the Australian accent, the English accent. It all helps. So we're not doing it for any other reason. Um, we hope people enjoy it as well. But uh, uh, obviously, it's... It's something that we enjoy ourselves. And uh, another one here from Arash. He says, amazing job, uh, guys. Uh, He says he's watched most of uh, the videos that I put out there. Awesome stuff. It helps me a lot in my decision making. He's obviously thinking of coming to Spain and, um, and, uh, you know, to... To, uh, to change his uh, life a little bit. I don't know where he's from, Arash, but maybe uh, India, maybe. I'm not quite sure. But, uh, yeah, so good luck, Arash, if um, you do come here. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. We're just, um, you know, trying to show people the uh, the reality, some of the good things, some of the bad things about uh, living in a foreign country, especially one where it might take you a little bit to get over that over that hill from a, a cultural point of view or a, or a language point of view along those lines, you know. Everyone is going to have a different experience when they come to a different country. Um, and a lot of it depends on the frame of mind of the person who's coming over. Uh, if they're coming over and they're happy to embrace a new culture, they're happy to try new things, they're going to find it a lot easier hmm. than someone who's sort of coming over, they want to do a specific thing. And, and sometimes that can get very frustrating. Um, and it's something that also I would like to express uh, very seriously to my Spanish friends and Spanish people in general that when people do talk about things they don't like in Spain it's not a criticism not to, yeah they're not trying to criticise Spain um, they're, they're just expressing a, a, a vast difference between the two cultures and something that is difficult to get used to. Um, you only have to look at, uh, for example, the, in the opposite way around. Uh, when Spanish people go to the UK, obviously the, the, the times of the, the meal times are so different. Uh, you get up earlier, you eat lunch earlier, you eat dinner earlier. The type of meals you have in each sitting is, is always very different to Spain as well. I don't honestly think there is a, a correct way of doing it. No. And there isn't one that's better than the other. They're just completely different cultures. Absolutely. And I think people need to understand that. It's, it's a, it is a big uh, culture shock when you move to a different country, mm. and it's just a matter of getting used to it. I did a video last year about, um, I think it was called, that living in Spain is not for everyone. Because I saw a, a, a blog post written by somebody who had a bad experience in, in Malaga. And uh, some of the points that you know he he mentioned were a little bit ludicrous, let's say. But s- some of them were um, were were relevant, and yeah, you you sort of have to take everything on board and and look at everything from a different perspective. And if you if you think that you're going to come here and and uh, you know dominate um, and uh, everything's going to be perfect, it's not going to be the case. Mm. So you have to you have to always keep those things in mind. And, um, you know, uh, try to look at the positives more than the negatives, I would say. Yeah. If you can. You've got to push through the negatives, uh, you know, if you want to uh, have a good experience in the long run. Um, I mean, (laughs) my first three years in Mallorca were fantastic. I loved Mallorca. Um, I mean, it was was a perfect uh, experience for me at that time of my life as well. But when I arrived in Madrid, one... Being a country bumpkin, turning up to the capital city of Spain, Big city. But, massive city. But that would have happened in any city, though, right? Yeah, that would have happened in any city. Um, but then also, I arrived in Spain uh, without speaking Spanish. Uh, I learned what I could in Mallorca, but it was difficult. And when I arrived, arrived to Madrid, my Spanish was uh, very, very basic. 
Um, and on top of that, I moved, because we didn't have much money at the time at all, uh, we actually moved to um, a quite an old uh, neighbourhood in Vallecas, uh, very, what you would call, I suppose, working class area, yep. uh, how people would describe it. Um, very down to earth people, the people were lovely, uh, but the area was quite run down. Uh, we were living in a flat which uh, I can only describe as a cave. It was awful. It was very dark. Had a lot of. Uh, we had a damp problem. Uh, we had to. We, we had rising to damp. Away. Yeah, we had to throw away a lot of our clothes. We had um, <laughs> some a few things stolen from our di- uh, dining room table really? because uh, pe- the window obviously was. Uh, it had oh, okay. got bars on the windows yeah, yeah. Uh, on the ground floor flats, but someone put their arm in with a stick and just sort of like, pulled things to it. Yeah, it just. Bad experiences, cockroaches. Um, it was just that awful experience at the time. But, you know, it was a year and a half of, uh, you know, just getting through uh, uh, a new experience. Yeah. And once you get through it, you know there's, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Always. You've got to improve your, um, your working environment, uh, you can find a better job, uh, improve how much money you're, you're earning, yeah. improve your language. I that's had to it. learn Spanish Absolutely. and that's what I was there for. And then when I did get a different job we found a nice flat in uh, Rivas and we came here and that, that's how it all started for us uh, so you just got to push through the, the hard uh, points and remember that you're living in a different country and you have to put up with things that you're not used to back home absolutely yeah so just on that topic there of um, acquiring property buying a house buying a flat you've uh, you've gone through that I've yeah. gone through that um, what was your experience like when you, uh, you know, fi- finally decided to invest in the Spanish uh, property market? Um, initially, the, the 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 search for the house was difficult for us because we were looking for something quite specific. Uh, I wanted a house with a garden, um, which at the time we were. Uh, looking to buy right in the middle of the boom uh, just before the crisis hit really yeah. everything had gone sky high um, but I I feel very claustrophobic in a flat because I grew up in a house so just to, for people that are not familiar with uh, housing here in Spain 95% of property would be flats in, maybe, in cities? I, yeah, maybe. I don't really know what the percentage is, but it's a very high percentage of flats. Yeah, uh, I, I haven't seen a Spanish city that, that is not flat dominated or apartment no. dominated. So it's, I think it's pretty much, well, all the ones I've been to, I think the, the majority of the centre of the cities yeah. are very much uh, uh, built up of flats. Uh, as you get to the suburbs, a bit like Rivas, you find areas, a mix. Uh, town which is a mix. And mm. I mean, Rivas, it's probably, I mean, Talking uh, land-wise, not the number of uh, um, you know number of houses, number of flats, but uh, land-wise, I'd say probably fifty-fifty, maybe between flats and uh, uh, houses in Rivas now. Maybe uh, I'm not sure. Well, but. there's been a lot more flats built. It's true, uh, yeah, recently, recently. Uh, I, obviously for financial reasons, for the councils and things like mm. that. But um, compared Compared to where I come from, everyone lives in a house. You probably yeah, yeah. In, in the UK as well. Uh, maybe in London, not so much, but um, outside of the, the bigger cities. Uh, whereas Madrid, uh, the centre of Madrid, is all flats. Um, yeah, it's very different. I mean, even if you, even if you compare Madrid to London, mm. if you walk through, through the streets in London, you'll find it's a lot of uh, housing, a lot yeah, of Victorian right, yeah. style housing, for example, mm. uh, Georgian housing. Basically, they're all terraced uh, houses. Uh, you have the front door directly onto the street. Uh, you walk up to the front door, into the house. Uh, basically, you've got your, your two or three floors. Yep. And then at the back, you've got a small garden as well, or big mm. garden, depending mm. on the mm. house. But there's a lot of houses around. Yep. Um, so not necessarily uh, detached houses. I mean, obviously, in big cities, that, that's not happening uh, very often. But you know, in Spain, it is the majority flats, and people are used to living in them. Me personally, I just wasn't used to living in a flat. I lived no. in a house all my life, and and I really used the garden and the outdoor space a lot back home, and I missed that here when I first got here. So to to get that, you had to move a fair way away from the city, as I understand, right? You were yeah. how what fifty k's? You said yeah, it's about fifty fifty five k's from okay. the centre of Madrid. Because uh, because we were in that housing boom at the time, mm. and realistically, for what people can afford it's a lot cheaper to move yeah, to those it's places. what we could afford at the time exactly. I mean, there are obviously the houses are a lot closer than, uh, mm. than that to, to Madrid like in Rivas but 
for a house in Rivas at the time, you were looking absolute minimum, minimum uh, 300,000. Yeah. And to find that would be virtually impossible. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, the house was already built? Yeah, it was. Uh, I think the house was built in the 1970s. Okay. Uh, the the ground floor was actually stone built, beautiful, big, uh, wide stone uh, walls, and then the uh, the first floor, which is actually the main living area of the house, um, was brick and then uh, rendered. So it was, uh, it was a, a lovely house. Uh, we had about 400 square meters of garden, a 90 uh, square meter patio, uh, the same level as the the first floor of the house. Yeah. Um, and then downstairs it was just a, a massive garage and uh, another storeroom at the bottom so it was uh, it was exactly what we needed at the time is what we wanted what we needed and, and we spent an awful lot of time in the garden doing the garden up mm. uh, I love uh, DIY so I, I spent a lot of time down in the garage doing bits and pieces yeah so so it, it wasn't the um, you didn't have to go through the you know building yourself or no or, no, no. no so it was fairly simple in that regard yeah, yeah. We 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 uh, we bought this place here just before the boom, so we were we were able to get a decent price. But it was a, a building nightmare. It was something that I wasn't really used to, yeah. and a lot of people here had the same problem because it took so long to build. You know, the, nobody ever um, finishes anything. <laughs> anything on time. Yeah. So I think we were supposed to be in here. Uh, end of 2001 or 2002 mm-hmm. didn't get in until the end of 2003 that also meant that the boom started and the the builders were extortionists basically they were uh, increasing they wanted to increase the price uh, some of the things that we um, were expecting like uh, built-in wardrobes uh, kitchen nothing was done they changed all of those things so we ended up having just empty spaces really? no kitchen appliances which was in, which was originally what we we thought we were going to do uh, going to have sorry and uh, it was a bit of a nightmare but at the end we got it and it was a huge relief because you hear so many bad stories about people that put down 15 20 thousand yeah. euros on in a deposit uh, to buy a, to buy a house or a flat and uh, the builder does a runner and so it's it's, it's it can be a nerve-wracking experience there are, yeah I heard of a lot of bad um, experiences down on the uh, some of the coastal areas of Spain um, there were a couple in Madrid there were a couple in Madrid uh, but I think uh, the ones that were specific scams where mm. people had actually done it on purpose yeah uh, I heard I heard about these scams down on the coast that were aimed mainly at tourists um, and immigrants uh, that were buying second homes or coming in and buying yeah. their first home there. but they were I think they were specific scams uh, there, but there were uh, a lot of uh, things going on uh, where builders had uh, become bankrupt or they uh, got got into money problems, and they literally just left things half built uh, and gone with all the money that you know deposits people had t- uh, paid. And what happened was the money that people had paid with the deposits had been used to buy the materials for the start of the building process, but because the building never finished. Yeah. Obviously, these people were well, they had there was nothing left for them to to claim back, mm. and they had just had a shell of a property, mm. uh, and that happened quite a lot, uh, which was a real shame, and um, you know it caught a lot of people out. Uh, a lot of people had very bad experiences. Mm. With it. Mm. Yeah, uh, so uh, you know, buy beware, basically. Yeah. I think you just got to make sure you you pick the right uh, company to use. Mm. Uh, do a little bit of research on the company first have a look to see if they've uh, finished other projects um, yeah. make sure that they're to your liking because because that that's one of the things that when the when that boom period happening and we could argue that there's another boom um, in the making now there's a lot of uh, fly by nighters because it's easy money for a lot of people to yeah. you know to to uh, to build these uh, properties and uh, make a make quite substantial profit so yeah, uh, like you said there, you know, make sure that you try to um, go for a, uh, a company that's got a reputation. Mm. Maybe, uh, as you said, that they've got other projects that have been completed, yeah. uh, especially in the coastal areas, not so much in Madrid, maybe in the bigger cities. But, uh, yeah, just uh, do your homework before. Exactly. You know? It's um, it's quite funny actually because uh, here in Spain, I think uh, a lot of Spanish people, uh, especially the ones I've, I know here, they often go for new builds. Uh, yep. They don't. They're not as interested in secondhand no. properties here. 
Uh, whereas back in the UK, I don't think it's really the case. Uh, no. A lot of people uh, are quite happy buying secondhand uh, properties because they know that the property is built, it's finished. Uh, if there's any problems with the property, it's already probably been found. Mm. Uh, and on top of that, in the UK, a lot of people like the um, the older traditional housing, mm. uh, houses that are 100 years old. Uh, you know, they're, they're very sought after. Yeah, yeah. Uh, especially in villages. Um, mm. they're, they're very very popular. You can do them up. Yeah, you can do them up. Mm. Yeah, sometimes they're listed buildings, so you can't do anything on the outside, but it's there to protect the buildings. That's it. Um, uh, and normally you can just modernise the inside, mm. um, and people just absolutely love it. They love uh, uh, the traditional uh, Victorian, Georgian houses, um, and they they actually have a quite a high uh, sale price because of that. Yeah. Often higher than their new builds. That's it. That's it. So um, you 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 sold your house. No, we we couldn't sell the house. I couldn't um, sell it okay. because we bought it just before the crisis. Ah, okay. Uh, basically, if we had sold the house, we would have been in negative equity. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a nice big mortgage, and uh, which yeah, well, yeah, yeah, a lot of people were in that in the same boat there. Yeah. So 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 now you're renting. Yes. Um, what's that experience like? Um, to be honest, we we've had uh, a couple of different experiences. We when we first came to Rebus, we were in quite a rush to get here. Really, uh, there was a couple of uh, personal uh, issues that we we needed to to get closer to family and closer to uh, to Rebus. Um, so we 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 found a flat uh, initially um, in the middle of Rebus. And it was it was great. We we were quite happy there for a while. We had some parks outside, so I wasn't quite uh, as claustrophobic as I had been prior to to buying my house. Uh, but within, I think it was we'd been there for about two years, two and a half years, something like that. Uh, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, we got a phone call from the owners saying we want to move back to our house. Yeah, I'm like, uh, what? Uh, you know, we just finished painting the whole flat as well, yeah. which we'd done out of our own expense. Um, and we were like, well, you know, what do you mean you want to move back? What, well, at the end of our contract, uh, we had a five-year contract. No, no, we, we want to move back next month. And they gave us a month's notice to get yeah. out of the flat. Mm-hmm. And they were allowed to by law yeah. because uh, they were going to move back into their own house. Okay. And that was very, very stressful. Yeah, so yeah. you had to find somewhere quickly. Yeah, and we were very lucky because in the end we actually found uh, our, our house that we're in now, which is a semi-detached house mm. with a garden. Um, it was a little bit run down. Uh, the, the owner of the house had had problems with it before um, uh, with the people that had been living there before. Yeah, no one yeah. had really looked after it very well. Um, and we actually uh, got the house for uh, the same amount of money we were paying for the flat. So it actually worked out well for us in the end. But win, it was a win, very stressful couple of months. Win-win. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my, my renting experience, I mean, I haven't been renting for a while, but when I first came to Madrid, my re- the first place I rented was similar to the one that you were speaking about in Bayecas there, which was a bit of a dodgy place. But I, I wasn't really worried at the time because I just needed somewhere central that you can you know move around the city. It was just really to sleep there. You're too busy with other things to worry about quality accommodation. Yeah. The next place we moved to wasn't much better, but it was a little bit bigger in a different area and so forth. And I, what I really found with the renting was that to get your first place uh it's going to be difficult uh maybe now you know with different websites it's a little bit easier i, I don't know but uh it's a really it's a word of mouth thing yeah uh, a lot of the time you know that the, the way that we found our second place was that there was an english girl living there and she was moving out so she told yeah. us about it and we went down and spoke to the landlord and he was happy to have some other people come in so so you know if you do come here and you're looking to get that perfect first apartment from a renting point of view forget about it unless you're willing to spend a lot of money yeah i mean well you you need the time to find it um so i think a lot of people they come over they uh well nowadays or they stay in airbnb or they uh stay in a hotel for a couple of weeks or yeah, something yeah. And, and then they think they're going to find something in a couple of weeks nah, and impossible. that's all sorted you, it, you might get lucky but unless you've uh, unless you've got a lot of money and yeah. you're willing to go for a top-end property yeah you're going to find it pro- uh, but, problematical but if you're looking in you know mid-range where everyone else is looking it's going to be uh it's going to be difficult yeah, yeah. Especially. especially in madrid oh absolutely uh, yeah. at the moment i mean i'm on the uh facebook page for the teaching assistants yeah. uh in madrid and there's, I think they must have about 15,000 people on that page really? now. Yeah, it's a, a huge group. Um, and people, they're 
they join every year obviously more people every year join the group because they're coming uh, mainly from the states the majority i think and they get here and they they're, they're in the airbnbs or they're sleeping on someone's couch and looking for i say couch because we're talking about americans the sofa uh <laughs> and we you yeah, know they're, they're, they're looking for the flat but of course everyone arrives in yeah. august and september yeah, so you've no, got yeah hundreds and hundreds of people looking for flats in august and september and yeah. of course people get people get taken advantage of uh, they put the prices up um they're really funny about who they're renting to um they they ask for ridiculous amounts of deposit um so yeah it's it's a very stressful experience for for those people coming over as well because yeah, yeah. they have no other way of doing it whereas if you've been here for a while you're already in a flat You've got time. Look in the right moment, uh, right time of the year. Know where to you're look. Not, know how to do it. Yeah, you're not mm. stressed. You sort of you're already living somewhere, so you're not you've yeah. got to worry too much. And you find somewhere else to sort of give you that step mm-hmm. up. Yeah. yeah. Well, a, a friend of mine uh, recently rented a place in Barcelona, and I think they asked for a six month um, deposit. I think. Yeah. You that's know? very normal now. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Uh, and legally, um, I don't think they're actually allowed to legally ask for a six-month deposit. Well, well, I don't think anything happens legally in a lot of the yeah, times, I've, you know. Though. Yeah, I think it's uh, – I think uh, I might be wrong. Uh, I'm not any sort of a lawyer, so I'm just talking from experience here and uh, uh, from word of mouth. But I think legally it's a one-month deposit um, uh, and, the, and the, the month's rent. And then they can ask for extra security deposit. Oh, okay. Um, which – if they put it in their uh, contract and everything, obviously it's a, it's a legal mm-hmm. uh, yeah. deposit, etc. But yeah. some people are actually asking straight up for a six-month deposit, mm-hmm. um, which on the contract I don't think is actually legal. No, no. Um, but, but like I said, sometimes those contracts are, uh, mm-hmm. are not always binding. So we'll uh, wrap up the podcast there for today. I'll say uh, thank you, John, for your uh, contribution again today. No problem. I'll see you next week. Remember that you can catch this podcast now on all of the major podcasting platforms, uh, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, uh, all of the uh, major podcasting platforms, as well as here on uh, YouTube if you are watching the video. So give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. Remember to leave a question uh, or a comment in the section below. Feel free to do that. We like to answer some of the questions if they are related to uh, living in Spain or some of the experiences that you can have here. We want to hear about your experiences as well. So feel free. We'll see you next week. Have a good day or a good week and uh, hasta luego.